body. I would know those four things on hepatitis B. That should going to be your main hepatitis. And you should be able to tell someone what does it mean. Because that's the most testing on any hepatitis. Okay, go to page four. Go ahead and highlight the herpes as a DNA. And then look how many herpes viruses they are, there are. You got the simplex, which is one, mouth lesions, two, genital, cervical. You have another herpes virus, so we just said they were DNA, so if it helps you to write next to a DNA. You have the, the chicken pox, which is varicella zoster, and you have the shingles in adults, okay? So all of those are herpes viruses, yes? On the registry, are they going to ask us for shingles, or are they going to say herpes zoster? Who knows? You got to know. It's that meat in adults, that's going to be shingles. In kids, it's going to be chicken pox. For CMV, remember, the other thing that is big with CMV, it's very much fetal transmission. That's another herpes virus, and so it's DNA. Page five. <clears throat> another herpes virus is the Epstein-Barr, and that's associated with mononucleosis. Another herpes virus is sixth disease. So all of those are DNA viruses that I think you could be exposed to, especially EBV, CMV, chicken pox, shingles, so varicella zoster, and your herpes one, mouth, and her the canker sores, and herpes two, uh, the vaginal GI, or lower. They sell below the belt is herpes two, above the belt is herpes one. Okay, under parvos virus, oh, papillovi pap papilloma virus, another DNA with the venereal warts. And on five at the top, the parvovirus, circle fifths disease. Um, on page six, an ar arbovirus, which is RNA, that was from the back page, I'd at least know what kind of virus is responsible for encephalitis. And the other one, other arbovirus that is DNA so, is German measles, down at the bottom of page six. Rubella are German measles. And remember, that is the one, at St. E's when I worked, we all had to be tested for it, and if we weren't, protected we had to get the vaccination so we wouldn't endanger a pregnant patient or a, a pregnant visitor so that was and i was one of them that did the rubella testing because i worked in serology at that time so that's a big one so that you don't infect a patient or a visitor um go to page uh, page seven at the bottom, the influenzas are an arthomyxovirus, and that's RNA. And across from it, paramyxovirus is your regular measles, rubiola. And the other paramyxovirus is the mumps. So the MMR, you have two of them are paramyxoviruses. And I think we said the, the rubella was an arbovirus. So that's something I would at least be aware of that, that vaccination. So, when, so once again, put the, this PowerPoint, put my study guide question key, then put your study questions. Then when you get the Scantron back, make sure you grade, chain, put the correct answers on your written test so you have it all easy to study. Okay, so that's all we're going to do with virology. You just need to get your uh, study materials organized with that. Okay, so what I wanted to do, I think it's at worth, at worth at least going through the mycobacterium one. I think it will probably be something 
you might get asked a question more so than some of the fungus and parasites. So <clears throat> what we're going to do first, I want to get these germ tubes in the incubator because it's a really easy procedure. Some of you already have some scopes out. We can put something on either side of the room. It is a reagent. Um, and it's so costly, we keep trying to use one even though there's stuff growing in it and it's kept work. It is crazy what these cost and I can't just order a bottle. It's outrageous, hundreds of dollars for one bottle. That's all I need. So I keep using it and it keeps working. So we're gonna take two yeast. We've worked with Glabrata in lab, but Albicans is the most common one you're gonna see. Albicans is known to produce a germ tube. So when we get to it's where it sat long enough, we'll put it on the, I'll pull up a screen to show you a germ tube, and then you can see they grow little appendages. So a yeast cell will just almost look like a red cell, but it'll grow almost like a little nose coming out of it. And normally you don't see a line as it buds off it. And Albicans is the only one who does it. It is germ tube positive. So when you get your first set of unknowns, one of you could potentially get the yeast. And you'd have to prove it is Albicans by doing a germ tube. You already see the Graham stain. It's the classic big positive oval. Um, so I think this is something you will all see. So I think it's important that we at least do this test today. Um, I tried growing a few things. This was actually off the bread Jen had brought in. So we're, we're going to do strawberries and we're going to do this with our slide culture because we got to get that set up. Um, we need to get it set up so that it, we keep it moist and it grows on this media called, uh, Seboroid dextrose auger. I did grow Tropicalis and uh, Glabrata, and I have Candida, Albicans. So what we're going to do, someone get a DeLost out and look under the mycology chapter for germ tube. So go in the back of it, and each desk should have how do we do a germ tube. And what we're going to do, so we have to, we'll get the reagent passed around, and then we're going to do an albicans. At your desk, just do albicans since you don't have someone else. But every group, the inside person is going to do albicans. The outside group, this side of the room is going to do tropicalis. That side of the room is going to do glabrata. Okay? So I'm going to start with you. And then I'll get some test tubes. I think you have probably need 0.5 mils. If someone wants to verify that. So just have to be patient since I don't have a ton of everything. So it's under behind mycology and it has to remember where, where are all the lab procedures? In the back. Of each chapter. So, what does it say? How much? Point five. Point five. So, put and then why don't you just pass your point five pipette back? It'll go faster. And then you guys, in fact, why don't we do this? Why don't you just pipette all of these? And then I'll pass them around since we only have one bottle of everything. Mm -hmm. About the inside of the I think she said all the cans for inside. Nope. 0.5 mil, so that has to be the blue pipette. I'm going to take them back. Well, no, I'll just, you'll, you'll pipette them. Put your pipette at 0.5, and as soon as she's done, I'll pass it over, and then you can pass them back. And then we'll, pa and then you guys will label them germ tube, and then what's it say to do with the bacteria? On the procedure. Small amount, not large. 
37 more than three hours. So you'll do it just, it doesn't say how many colonies, just a small amount small it says? Amount, large amount large. will produce false negative results. It doesn't say specific, it's a small amount. But it's a small amount, too much they're saying. I think you should be able to just touch the colonies a couple times with a loop and mix it in. Yep. And then pass them back. Yep. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass them, and you guys will put germ tube inside Albicans, U2 glabrata. So it's Candida Albicans, Candida glabrata. Inside Albicans, Candida tropicalis, the outside. Those two outsides should not produce these appendages. It's a pretty cool little test. Albicans is the only one who, who does it, so it, it was very commonly the one they used to identify if they thought they had Candida albicans, which is going to be the most common yeast you run across when you're working. What? Yes. Okay, pass those two back. I know, just if you get it, that's okay. We've had something growing in it forever. But it's so too costly, I can't afford one bottle to spend that kind of money. Okay. It turns brown and watery. And there you go. Okay, so now I'll take this from you. Yeah. I guess we'll go. We won't have to worry about it. Then you put the paper albicans and then pass it back to Jen. Okay. I just take a colony and put it Try. Yeah, just touch it once or twice. And then um, you can actually even uh, pass the loop back. What's in the no, don't because you're going in the meat, this stuff. Germ tube is like rabbit serum. I think it says that. Oh, that's what's in the bottom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just do the best you can. It has junk in it. We're going to just, hopefully it still grows. So you put trop, C tropicalis, you put C albicans. Your albicans, insides albicans, and your tropicalis. And then uh, you will put, you have to wait for the albicans. You put the tropicalis and then pass it back to Elisheba and then to Krista. So we should have enough if someone gets it on an unknown. It's still been working. So. I think it's a really neat one for you to see, and it's pretty easy. Do we just have one plate of albicans? Yep. Okay. We have to be patient. <laughs> There's only really one plate of everything. And the glabrata and tropicalis are on the same one. I know. Which one are we supposed to grow? This is one of the medias that grows fungus very well. It's called uh, SDA. The you did. Oh, you did. Uh, but that's okay. It's a negative. As long as we have a negative. Okay. Labrada and tropicalis should be negatives. Albicans. That way we'll have a positive and negative on every side of the room. So then they come over here, put your initials, and you can throw your loop away and then put it in the incubator. And we're just going to read them. Um, before we leave, that way they should at least sit an hour because I, I still want to have you do, uh, I think we're going to try to do a scotch tape test. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I hope it works even though the reagent is getting contaminated. I took something out of the reagent that looked like what I was hoping to grow from the strawberries. This green with white edged. It's usually a penicillium or an aspergillus that's really cool under the microscope. So I have it plated. We'll see if it grows. I thought what was growing on the bread was green. So I it's not growing green though. I was praying. So this will be interesting because this is what we mean when you do your presentation. If you can give me a picture of a, a top, this is the top. 
and it would be white, fuzzy, almost cottony. And then if some of you can give me the reverse what it looks, it's not white and cottony, it's almost like an orangey peach color. So on your presentation, if you can get a picture of the top and the reverse, which is okay if you only give me the top, that's what helps. This is the macroscopic view and that gives you some big clues. So one of the two that are common contaminants that I usually get from somebody's refrigerator is a penicillium or an aspergillus. One looks like a dandelion or the head of broccoli. And the other one, I always think of Kramer from Seinfeld. It, the hair shoots up straight and they're just interesting to see and they're nothing bad for you. But we, I'm hoping the thing that was growing in the germ tube is one of those because it looked like it on top of that. Okay, so that is our germ tube. So if you learn anything about Candida albicans, to confirm it, it's a positive germ tube, and that's as easy it is. Letting it sit is the worst part in our. And you know, look just like in a little appendage growing out of a, a circle or like an oval cell. And you just put it on a, a mix it, put it on a cover slip, cover slip over it, and you look under the microscope and you look for the yeast first, and then you start looking for little appendages. So that's why, if at all possible, um, well, we can just make a slide of each. You'll want to see that the Glabrata and Tropicalis don't have appendages, but the albicans should grow one. And that confirms it's Candida albicans. So if you got a uh, candida on your first practical or unknown, you'd have gram positive Y, you'd have gamma growth. If it was glabrata, that was stayed pinpoint. This will grow bigger if it's albicans. It'll probably be small, maybe medium, but it's still gamma. And it still possibly will grow with CNA. Remember, uh, glabrata hardly grew that you could tell it even in the first quadrant and it won't grow on McConkie. So it's, you're going to have similar features with your morphology, whether it's Candida albicans or Glabrata, but this would be the test you do next. You would do a germ tube. If it's positive, you would identify it as Candida albicans, and then you'd look to see what you would do. One of them we picked out the other day when we did that worksheet was Amphotericin B is something they use for fungal infections. So that would be what you have to do on your first unknown. Okay, mycobacterium, I just feel we need to go, that would be worth doing. So you have that PowerPoint, and if you want to have the PowerPoint out, and if I can try to flag some things like I did on the viruses. So you already were able to tell me the two stains, do you remember them? Cold and hot? Can you? Okay, Nielsen. and the Zeal Nielsen. And how do you, if they would be a gram positive bacillus, but we don't do a normal gram stain. So the doctor has to suspect them. Usually it's gonna be on a sputum culture and he's gonna order a culture for acid fast. So tell me, does anybody remember two media from your study questions? There's two you gotta know. Two very common ones. Selective. Low and steam Jensen will probably grow anything. Middle brooks can be selective depending on if they put antibiotics in them. But those are two common media. So remember how I want you to study for the registry? What is your genus? What are the biochemicals that are associated with it? And what are some key disease state with key pathogens? Well, you should know if they talk about an egg-based media for mycobacterium, this is the one that is egg-based. You should know LJ, a lot of times they call it LJ media, is egg-based. So you already know they don't do typically a normal gram stain to identify, so what do they use? What's it called? You already gave me the hot and cold methods. What is the primary stain? Carbofuxin. And what is the color if you maintain the primary stain? The primary stain. It won't be, it won't be purple, it'll be pink. So it's opposite the gram stain. Then why do the mycobacterium hold the primary stain? 
what is their cell, cell wall really full with? Lipids. High lipid. And then what is the decolorizer compared to the gram stain? It's acid alcohol. Acetone alcohol is in the gram stain. And it can't strip that high lipid uh, cell wall so it stays pink. But what is the counter stain? Methylene blue. So everything else, nocardia is partially uh, acid fast. That's a bacteria we'll get to when we do gram positive bacilli. But normally they all wash to colorless and then they'll maintain the methylene blue because you're not trying to decolorize that. It just will take it up. So those are things I would circle as we get to them. Many times, oh sorry. Many times they're found in wet environments. <clears throat> and probably the two biggest ones, they're kind of fungus life. Um, that's what the term kind of means. But they do like moist environments. We also talked about Pseudomonas, how it likes moist environments, but TB does too. So this has a lot of background information, but when you think about TB, you should have heard about tuberculosis, which is the main one that you can die from, that back in the day they used to put you in what they called asylum, away from everybody when you got it, and it was usually infective in your lung. And you still can get it, but it's nothing like it used to be. The other big one was leprosy, so Mycobacterium leprae. And you should know, which in the PowerPoint, another term for that is Hansen's bacillus. Um, those are probably the two biggies that are true, true pathogens. But then you get to some types that are called mycobacterium other than tuberculosis. They're called mott. And I had you break them into the runyon groups based on can they grow in the presence of light? Can they grow in the presence of no light? Can they grow in light and dark? Or are they just fast? They can grow in three to five days. Most cultures, they'll hold for eight to nine weeks. So if you have any clinical that you go to that still will put them on, on media, it's eight to nine weeks you hold them and check them weekly. So normally they're very slow growers. So I tried to pick out ones that you might be exposed to on the registry. Uh, so it is truly the main one, tuberculosis, that is a true pathogen. The others are more opportunistic. And we'll talk about one called avium intracellular that isn't associated with pe people with HIV because what, they don't have their CD4 helper cells and they get a lot of weird stuff that more, normally people won't get. So I tried to flag some of the key things, acid fast, aerobic. So, so far we've only talked about one aerobic bacteria in our 14 organisms, it was Pseudomonas. So this is another truly aerobic organism. It has high lipid content with mycalic acids and it contains a factor called cord factor wax D. So I tried to bold some things for you. <clears throat> So I taught, these are the two key pathogens, but the others are associated with other mycobacterium that don't cause tuberculosis. But they can be opportunistic, especially in AIDS victims. So another one that you might hear uh, is bovis. Normally it's a TB of cattle, but Potentially, people who handle that infected can cattle could get it, but it's still not a true pathogen like tuberculosis. So this is kind of a difference in uh, the different cell walls that you have, so you can compare a gram positive versus a gram negative versus someone that is mycolytic rich. So it does look like a more highly defined structure compared to the other two. So that is a comparison for you. We already talked, I bolded the droplet nuclei. 
That's why I definitely pay attention if they have an aerosol uh, person in a private room with aerosol possibilities of infecting you, that within three feet of that patient, you want to have a mask on in case they do cough and it hangs suspended. So that is a big way you get the infection. And the, there's primary and there's secondary or reactive tuberculosis. So primary usually begins middle or lower lung, spreads through lymphatics to the regional lymph nodes. In three to six weeks, it can spread to the bloodstream and then infect other areas. And these are terms you need to be aware of. If you hear of tubercles or caseation, you should be thinking TB. So tubercles are a combination. These are the lesions that kind of grow in your lung. And it includes the macrophages, the bacteria itself, epithelial cells, and lymphocytes. And they call them tubercles. And when they break down, it looks like um, cheese, like curdled cheese growing and forming as these tubercles break free and lose their contents. So they call them like cheese-like masses. So you should refer to tubercles with the, these granulomas and caseation as these cheese-like masses that form. So it's kind of a feature. So I tried to bold some of the key points. You know, if you don't have any time, at least pay attention to the bolded things. A secondary TB, or they call it sometimes reactivation, Anybody who's had primary can get it again. And this is when it does, it has laid dormant and then it does infect the other organs. And the big deal is it is long-term multi-drug therapy. I told you the, the friend of mine who got it while she was working in the PT department and was on rifampin and isoniazid for nine months. And she was in her 20s. You know, and didn't even know it till she went to take a, a aerobic test. They had to do so much running to be in the state police when she decided to switch careers. <clears throat> and this is, let me turn the, this is the key thing. If you want to know what's the clue on it, if they all have an acid, if, I don't know if you can see, the key thing is their pink bacilli. So you'd say on an acid fast stain, the presence of many gram negative bacilli. So the doctor has to order a sputum for acid fast culture. That way they know they gotta do an acid fast stain, not a gram stain, and then they gotta plate it on Lowenstein Jensen and Middlebrooks or whatever media they choose those are probably the two most common. So all other bacteria would look what color? They'd be blue or purple with the methylene blue. So remember, there's not many that are pink. Nocardia would be a bacillus as well. So it would be a much lighter pink and not everyone would be pink when it's partially acid fast. So remember, it's an acid fast stain. You're gonna be pink bacilli is positive acid fast. Um, they, so this AFB is what they're gonna do a culture for. So if you see that acronym, they're looking for TB or something with mycobacterium. And um, they're very slow growing. So normally, remember, it's gonna be, you're gonna hold a culture for eight to nine weeks, unless it's one of your few fast growers. And so this is another acid fast stain, just probably at like a thousand magnification, showing the gram. They, so that's considered the acid fast positive. Yes. Is acid fast, if it's positive for that, is it also gram negative or gram positive or neither? This work. one would be gram positive. Okay. 
and nocardia would be gram positive. Those are the only two I really know that are acid fast positive. So those two would be gram positive bacilli if you did a gram stain. But you need to find something. If you're suspecting it could be TB, you're different. you've got to find something that is unique for it. And that's why you wouldn't even bother doing a gram stain because it's not going to separate it. Um, nocardia, we get into that when we get into gram positive bacilli and they can be a really gross forming a thing called a mycetoma which if any of you are doing your disease states for fungus, some of you will have ones that cause these really gross wound infection called mycetomas that, I mean, they invade your tissues around your, your bones. <clears throat> so pulmonary is going to be your most common type. Usually, you, if in microbiology, you're going to get a sputum culture, and the doctor's going to say also for acid fast. So you're going to plate it like a normal sputum on your blood, McConkie's, maybe a chocolate, depending on if it's Haemophilus, something fastidious. But if he says acid fast, you're also going to plate it to the Lowenstein Jensing and Middlebrooks and do a acid fast stain as well. Okay, if he, but they have to specify. So normally you're not going to do anything for TB unless the doctor orders a culture with acid fast. You can do, I'd say urine might be the next one, but this is primary, if you want to circle the pulmonary, that's going to be your primary culture specimen you'll see in your normal lab. This is a big slide. Star it. How do you process, especially a sputum, that you will make sure you can get the bacteria you're looking for because there might not be many present. Sometimes you have, I think sputums to me are grosser than uh, stools because a stool I can put under a hood and that smell I'm not dealing with. A sputum looks gross no matter where you're processing it, especially when it's that thick, uh, almost snotty gel look. So. You have to do these three things if you got an acid fast culture. Anybody remember from your study questions what digesting means, what decontaminating means, and what concentration means? You got to get rid of the protein crap that might be around. What's there? Saliva. Any any stuff just from getting the specimen that might stop you from seeing the bacteria. So you got to digest any extraneous stuff that might be in your specimen that might be hiding the bacteria. Then decontaminate. If I don't give a great sputum, what are you going to have a lot of normal flora from? Your mouth. So decontaminate means Get rid of as much normal flora as you can. So there's reagents they add to help get rid of the extra protein stuff, get rid of any normal flora, and then what do you think concentrating means? Kind of like a cytospin. They concentrate that body fluid so everything that's present, cells or whatever, goes to that one little area. So they're going to then concentrating it probably through some kind of centrifugation, but it has to be capped. Remember, you never want to create an aerosol. Then you plate that concentrate. So then you have more chance. So if you hear digest, decontamination, concentrate, you should be thinking that's for mycobacterium. So sometimes you may not know everything, but if you kind of know what goes with. So if you hear Lowenstein, Jensen, Meadowbrooks, that's why I have you study your biochemicals, your disease states. If you study what fits, you at least put yourself on the right track. If I hear Lowenstein, Jensen, I'm not worrying about a streptococcus. You don't use that media for strep or staph, but I should be thinking this for mycobacterium, okay? So this is a big deal. You know how to process your specimen. So I tried to bold probably the two most common ones. There was a ton of media, but Middlebrook and Lowenstein, and this is the egg-based one. So, and I've seen a registry in either HAR or the BOC when we were doing our test, 
that had mention of the egg-based media, and you had to know, oh wow, that, I went right to the Lowenstein Jensen in my list because that's the only egg-based one. So, normally you'll incubate it with a little extra CO2, so they'd be capnophilic, and then you want to keep them for eight weeks because primarily uh, more of them are slow growers. Now, this is the part that I, I said I got a little peeved because some people chose not to do much with this on their study questions. I just wanted to know what is the principle and then gave, give me a positive example and a negative example. So when you're going through your biochemicals, you see aerosulfatase or parazamidase. Have you heard of that ever? You won't. By the end of the class, only in this PowerPoint. So that's why you got to learn what things kind of go biochemically with which genus, okay? So this is an example of the ones that were on your study guide. And then you already gave me, you already gave me the hot and cold, I would circle those. If you don't know anything else, I would at least know Zeal, Nielsen, and Coldstein. They are naturally, with everything, doing PCR, DNA or RNA amplification. So that's becoming, that's going to be everywhere for every organism. <laughs> and this one I only want you to know, if they're going to do a fluorescent stain, these it should be the bright fluorescent ap apple green, even like FITC. If you don't know anything else, just know if they were going to do a fluorescent stain for TV, it would be or oramine. You know, maybe those of you who get to work, if you ever get to work in a, a specialty lab or a reference lab, they might do something with a fluorescent scope. I don't think any of your normal labs that still do TV will do anything but the uh, typical acid fast. But oramine. FITC, you should be thinking chlamydia, ANAs, with the IFA and the DFA from serology. If you see oramine, it should be something that goes with TB. If you see the stain calcifloor, that is a stain that goes for fungus. So, so India ink, that would be cryptococcus neoformans. So if you don't know anything else, if you at least can, oramine would be something for TB if a site did uh, a fluorescent scope. And this is, I tried to give you <clears throat> these terms, because you should at least, we're gonna pick out something from everyone I want you to highlight. These are the, the mycobacterium other than TB, okay? They're called MOT. So, those that only grow yellow, and the colonies get very bright yellow. They're not beige or buff. They get very yellow if they like direct light. So, photochromogens, you should know that term, they do the yellow pigment when they're in light. Scotochromogens, they don't care. They'll get dark yellow or bright yellow, whether you put them in a dark closet or if you put them exposed to light, they don't care. They get bright yellow. Non-photochromogens stay this beige or buff color, kind of like we say the NLFs are. They don't take up any color. They just kind of stay. Uh, that media starts as pink, but as an NLF grows on it, it looks beige. I mean, it, it doesn't really have any color. That's how these grow. And then you have rapid growers. These two, they don't take eight to nine weeks. So that's a big clue what you're working with. There's only really two. And if they, if you see your colonies growing in three to five days, you already know one of the two you're working with. So let's do circle Kansasi. The tap water bacillus Gordonae. And I would definitely do avium intracellular. And I would put next to it HIV patients. And there's only two that are rapid growers, so fortuitum and colony. But 
These are under mycobacterium other than tuberculosis. So normally they're not pathogenic unless you are immunocompromised. And HIV probably of this whole group, avium intracellular, you think of with AIDS patients. And then um, this just is a little bit about the skin test. You went over four hypersensitivity tests with Diane back in serology. The TB test falls under type the type four that had to do with lymphocytes, okay? So that is an example of a type four reaction, that skin test. So, and that's one they expect you, a hospital person has to have this yearly. This is just the, the, the loan time. Two, there's a two-step that some labs require for like physical therapy, they have a two-step TB test they do. We're good with just doing the normal within 72 hours to see if you have the raised area. And they should just put it gently right under the skin, a little bubble. And it's, the, it's supposed to be more than 10 millimeters. And some people re react to the medicine. So it's not just if you have a raised red area, it's automatically going to be something bad. And then there's the different classifications. And then this is just a little bit more on uh, the ones that aren't. Ulcerins is another one that is not part of the MOT group. Um, a lot of them get these grotesque, cutaneous. Well, this one's even up on the upper body. But a lot of times they start on the lower extremities. extremities you'll see that's one called ulcerans. It's the third most common uh, mycobacterial and a lot of them are associated with Africa. Avium in intracellular, that's the one that's associated with AIDS. And really the big thing with therapy, if you only know at least nine months of therapy and the two biggies for TB would be the rifampin and isoniazid. I don't really care if you would know all the other drugs for your registry, but at least I would at least know those two. And then this is just an example of it being acid fast on an acid fast stain. All, macro, all mycobacterium, even if they're opportunistic, are acid fast. And then a little bit something about leprosy. So it, it, the big one you see is the skin infections, but it can uh, involve the peripheral nerves, upper respiratory tract, and the eyes. And it's called, you should know, mycobacterium leprae causes leprosy, and it's also called Hansen disease, because that's who it was discovered by. So that is a true pathogen like tuberculosis. And then it also has the grotesque cutaneous lesions that, I mean, a major scarring don't just heal and go away. So if it stays localized, it's better, but it can disseminate and be systemic. And then that's just another uh, example of a uh, acid fast stain. And then this is just an example. I think we picked, we circled Kansasi, second to M tuberculosis causing lung disease. Gordon A is called the tap water bacillus, rarely infectious. Um, Scrofulosium is something that does cause cervical lymphadenitis in children. I tried to pick out some that are kind of likely to cause something. Colony fortuitum, remember, was the fast growing immunocompromised patients. So remember that MOT, M O T T, you usually are immunocompromised before you ever get an infection. Leprae and tuberculosis are true pathogens no matter who you are. Yes. Which one was fast growing? Which one was what? Fast, fast growing? growing? Colony fortuitum. That was on your page that uh, you 
had with the groups, the Runyon groups, yeah. photochromogen. It was the last group. I remember them. Okay. We're going to try to set up a slide culture that we got to try to keep growing. So we'll do a plate per table. So go to your fungus and look up slide culture. We're going to set these up. Um, and we're hoping we at least get those set up and maybe by Thursday get to take a look if they're growing. Are we splitting it down? Yeah. I'm going to show you if um, our adapter sticks. Oh, here. Do you want to go around and pass two out to every person? But I thought since um, we have another holiday, so we lose another Monday, I thought we'd try to set it, the slide culture, get it growing today. I told him at Barnes, I at least try to teach you some of the techniques, even though we don't get, none of them are going to do much. Um, fungus. So, does have any, I'm going to, did we save little tweezers in your drawer? Do you have tweezers with your gram stain? Okay. You need your tweezers and take, go ahead and take two loops per table. You can see where we flame them. Oh. Well, you can go in your <laughs> and if you need another tweezers, I have. If you don't have a gram stain, I have some more tweezers. There's Paralus, your 2013. Here's a pair. Um, if you get them done, go ahead. But when we leave, that's that's fine. Okay. This, the slide culture, did anybody find the page in the lost? Three, here you go. Look in the back of fungus. What was it? Three, eight, six. Allow me. Okay. So, one side of the room, we're going we're gonna to have your side of the room work with the bread. And in that side of the room, we're going to actually work with the actual strawberry. I know they're gross, but um, this is supposed to be the best method for looking at the structures underneath the scope. So we're going to take one of the medias for fungus that we'll get to our next time. We'll do some lecture on fungus. This is saboroid dextrose. You're going to try to plane um, what we're going to, well, we'll probably try it. I don't know if it takes them a while to heat up. Why don't we do this? Let's take alcohol real quick and clean. I'm going to pass a set back to each table. Clean your... Uh, your probe things, your, the things I just gave you that look burned with alcohol and let it dry a minute. Set it on a chem wipe and I'll show you on a plate. Anybody have the, any left of the plates? Actually, good there. You got to take your there's actually, I think fungus are really gross macroscopically, but they're actually beautiful under the microscope. So last year it worked wonderful. <laughs> so we're going to take this. And you have the applicator sticks they, that you put them back. Okay. You're going to break them in half because you're going to have to be able to slip, and you're going to need a slide. And I think I don't want, I'm going to see if I can find slides that are that are actually, so you gotta, this has to kind of fit, since you're gonna share, you're gonna try to each share 
So one of you will do one of you will do your slide over on the side and the other one will do it. You want it raised. Oh, and I already forgot you gotta have a piece of filter paper in the bottom of your dish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 